Welcome back to our series, A Season of Reflection, Lenten Studies to Prepare for Easter Celebrations. It is our hope that through these conversations, you will be inspired and equipped to lead your congregation in this season of repentance and reflection. I'm your host, Nicole caldwell Gross, and today is our last episode. But don't worry, we've got you covered. If you have missed our other two conversations with Magre de Vega or with Susan Robb, don't worry, you can go to amplifymedia.com where they are available on demand 24 seven. Now listen, today I am so excited to welcome our guest, Adam Hamilton, a pastor, a preacher, a leader, an author who really needs no introduction for he is known the world over as the senior pastor at the Church of the Resurrection in Kansas and the author of many, many, many books, including his new study, Words of Life, Jesus and the Promise of the Ten Commandments Today. Hey, Adam, thank you for joining us. Nicole, it's great to be with you today. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who are joining us and and, uh, viewing this podcast. We're really glad you are. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of all of us, uh, this has been such an unprecedented time in our world. And it's been an unprecedented time for me and in in my family because we've been spending more time playing card games and board games than at any other time in my life. I have been browbeaten into this by my three children. And don't tell them, but I actually like it now. And one of the games that I love, maybe you've played this before, is apples and oranges where you're trying to figure out the one thing that doesn't fit with all of the other things. And I would venture to say that for many Christians, the 10 commandments, Jesus and Lent, seem a bit like a game of apples and oranges. But Adam, you see it differently and you call us to see it that way too. I wonder what inspired you to write this book and where you see that connection between the Ten Commandments and Jesus. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. A great question, Nicole. And, and we've been the same. We've been, I turned to my wife the other night and I said, you know, it's amazing. We've been together more than we've ever been in our almost 40 years of marriage. Yeah. And we feel more in love with each other than we ever have. I and mean, there've been so many good and beautiful things that came yeah. out of, you know, having to office at home and, you know, all of this, but it's, it's been, there's been a lot of blessings, a lot of blessings, and mm-hmm. obviously a lot of pain out there too. Um, so when you think of the 10 commandments, I told Levon two years ago, I want to write a book on the 10 commandments. And she looked at me like, why would you write a book on the 10 commandments? I mean, like, <laughs> like what? And she said, well, like, you know, I, I believe in them and I try to live them, but I, I, uh, I don't think they sound very inspiring. You know, it's a mm-hmm. bunch of thou shalt nots. And I said, no, it really right. isn't like that. And, uh, and so when we think about Lent in particular, you know, Lent is a season of reflection and introspection, a season of repentance, a season to mm-hmm. examine our lives in the light of God's will. And when we look at the Ten Commandments, they are, uh, they are the foundational set of principles, laws, commandments, words that God gave to us. They were literally, they were ten words is how they're described in Exodus. Uh, words from God describing what God's will was for how we relate to God and how we relate to one another. And mm-hmm. so during the season of Lent, when we're trying to figure out what is God's will and what do I need to repent of and where does my life not line up with uh, God's will, you know, this, this is a great place to start. And you know, we think of the law, but, but in the Ark of the Covenant, you know, we don't have the entire law. We have the 10 words, the 10 commandments. And by the way, it's, it's interesting the way, the reason why most people talk about the 10 commandments in the last, the, where they've made the news in the last 10 years is people wanting to display them on granite boulders right. in front of courthouses <laughs> or in, in schools and, you know, people fighting to have the right to have the 10 commandments displayed. But what was interesting is that God commanded Moses to put them in a box. He didn't hmm. command the 10 commandments to be displayed in public. They were not displayed in public. They were put inside the Ark of the Covenant. And what God's will was, I think, is that people would memorize the commandments. They would learn them. They would be written on their hearts Mm -hmm. and they would be displayed in their lives. And so we're meant to display the Ten Commandments in our daily lives. And they are fundamentals. You know, the first three, or you could maybe argue four, uh, have to do with loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the last Mm -hmm. six or seven have to do with loving our neighbors we love ourselves. And, uh, And Jesus said that is the essence of what it means to follow God, to be his, you know, to be his disciples. And so uh, it's interesting in throughout church history, Lent was a time where people did read the commandments. They chanted the commandments in some traditions. In the Methodist tradition, in our early liturgies, 
uh, the Ten Commandments were read uh, each week. They were, there was a liturgy that went back and forth with the Ten Commandments. And so, you know, and, and today, the only place we, we still see that is, uh, is in the showing of the movie, The Ten Commandments, at the end of the you know, at Easter. So, you know, that's, that's a tradition that's gone on for, you know, decades now. But looking to see what is it that God wants from us and how does God want us to order our lives is really important. And what Jesus does with them, you find the Ten Commandments throughout all of his teaching. I mean, in the Gospels, repeatedly, if you're really looking for it, you'll find he, he's addressing the Ten Commandments or he's reinterpreting the Ten Commandments or he's expanding what they mean for us today. So, I mean, that's a rich and my hope was to write this book on the Ten Commandments to help people rediscover their meaning, to look at the meaning of the Ten Commandments in their historical context. What did they mean to ancient Israel? Then to look to see what did Jesus do with the Ten Commandments? How did he expand them? How did he turn them on their head? What did he do with them? And we can talk more about that in a minute. And then finally to say, how do they relate to us today? And when you really dig in, you find, wow, these things are really relevant for our lives every single day. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing not only what inspired you to write this book, but also that unique history we once had in this season and how through this book, you're calling us back to that history and centering this in our conversation, in our liturgy, in our worship around Lent. I, I want to take us to your first chapter. And you write there, and I, I'm quoting here, when I began my study of the Ten Commandments, I could think of five or six that I wrestled with one way or the other, but the first commandment didn't come to mind. You go on to say, the more I reflected on what constitutes a false God, however, the more I realized that this might be the commandment I am most tempted to break. That really jumped out at me. Would you share more about why that is and what that may mean for each of us? Sure. So, <clears throat> you know, my wife, when, when we were first talking about this, she said, like, you know, which of us is going to follow some other God? And I'm like, really? <laughs> you don't see any ways that we follow other gods? And then she's like, oh, yeah, I, I get it. But <clears throat> this idea, first, first of all, I'll mention this, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Jewish tradition, the first commandment, because these are ordered slightly differently in, the, in Judaism and in uh, Catholicism and Lutheranism versus Methodism and the rest of Protestantism. In Judaism, the first commandment is, uh, I am the Lord your God. And mm -hmm. it's really interesting. You have this image of God speaking from the top of Mount Sinai to the masses of freed slaves, you know, Israelite slaves who've been set free by God. And he says, you know, to a people who felt like they were children of a lesser God in mm -hmm. Egypt, you know, he says, no, I, I am Yahweh. I am the maker of everything. I'm the source and sustainer of everything. And I am your God. And the word you're there is singular. It was, it meant every single one of you, I am your God. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really powerful to think that God claims us and says, I want you, I want to be your God. And when you own that, when you understand that, you know, people who have been living in slavery in Egypt suddenly feel like, wait, the God of the universe wants me, has chosen me. And so it's mm -hmm. such a powerful idea. We, you know, the rest of us look at that as the preamble to the Ten Commandments. But then you go into, you shall have no other gods before me. And you think about what constitutes a God. And this is, you know, I define it in the book as what's at the center of your life, where you find your security, where you find your identity, where you mm -hmm. find your value and worth. Um, it's what drives you. It's what, uh, you know, what drives your, you know, what you think about, what you, you know, you spend your time focused on. And you begin thinking about it. And there are all kinds of other gods that, you know, things that become at the center of our lives that we don't even mean. And they're mostly good things like our family. You know, my love for LaVon might be at the center of my life. My, my value and worth might come from what she thinks about me. But what happens if she leaves me? Or what happens if she dies? And, and suddenly I, you know, that was my whole life was caught up in my love for LaVon or exercising and working out. I know people who, you know, they read far more, you know, fitness magazines than they ever think about reading the Bible. And their identity is based upon their physique, on their physique and what they look like. Mm. Or, you know, for pastors, it might be the church and ministry. Mm. And I realized that, you know, so many times I'm driven. I mean, I, I, you know, I've driven to try to be a great pastor and to preach great messages and to try to lead my congregation well. And sometimes I've wondered if, you know, I've, I've identified the church as my mistress sometimes. Uh, mm. Sometimes I've thought of the church as my false God, you know, and, it, and again, all of these things are good things. Being a pastor, being in ministry, your job, you're saving for retirement, whatever it is, money, power, you know, all of these things mm -hmm. can be wonderful things. They're all good, but they're meant to have their right place. And if you put them in the wrong place, then things get messed up. And, yeah. and that's where I think we miss the fact that this commandment, the first commandment is foundational because it's like, what's at the center of your life? What is, what defines you? 
uh, what drives you and, uh, and, and where do you find your worth and value? And that for us comes in the God who says, uh, you are mine and I'm mm. yours. And, uh, so, and, and one of the primary gods we find, of course, is the ego or the self. And, yeah. uh, and so one of the acronyms that many of you have heard is uh, for ego is edging God out mm-hmm. and we become at the center. And if we're at the center, everything else, it's like having a bad foundation in a house. Nothing else quite works yeah. versus having a clear, a clarity around whose am I and why am I here and where does my worth come from? And that mm-hmm. heals a lot of brokenness in our lives. Yeah. You know, I grew up in a church where there was a lot of audible response to the sermon. And there was a member of our church who would always say, you're stepping on my toes, pastor. You're stepping on my toes. That response, I think, stepped on a lot of our toes as faith leaders Mm -hmm. and to really question ourselves about who our God really is, especially if that might even be, you know, to use your term, the mistress of ministry. Um, I, I wonder if, as you were working through this study and you discovered some of those false gods, how did you reorder your spiritual life so that God could really be at the center? Right. Well, you know, I do think, uh, like on this first commandment, when we, you know, part of the task, and this is why knowing the Ten Commandments is important, is I need to know what God's will is and I need to reflect upon it. And most of us have learned the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Though I did an informal study with the congregation. And I found that most people could only name five and, uh, mm. and then they didn't even have those in the right order necessarily. So most people struggle. I hope a quiz is not coming, yeah, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I did this. Actually, I have a Vespers with about a thousand people who joined me last, last Tuesday night. And I said, I want you to take out a piece of paper and I want you to quiz you right now. And then I'll tell you what the thing can be. Let's just see how you did. And, you know, I had people report on the screen on Facebook Live, you know, how they did. And, and again, most people were like five or six, you know, like, gosh, mm-hmm. I need to learn this. So it's yeah. when, you know, it's when you understand, okay, this is, this is, how God desires for us to order our lives. Once I know that, then that leads me to be able to go to examine myself, which is what Linda is all about, to examine Mm -hmm. myself and say, where do I fall Mm -hmm. short in this? And and then that leads to repentance, right? And repentance literally means uh, to have a change of mind, to see things differently. I didn't see that before. Now I see it. So we have a change of mind that leads Mm -hmm. to a change of heart, that leads to a change of behavior. And so for me, it's, you know, it, I pray these 10 commandments. I have taken them one by one and prayed them. I've taken long walks praying. I get on my, when I, you know, in the videos for this study, I, uh, I took people to Egypt and I take them up Mount Sinai. And when I was in the middle of the night, so we could watch the sunrise from the top of Mount Sinai. And as I was walking up there by myself, most of the trek, I was praying through these 10 commandments. And, and, you know, for us, we just had, uh, we just came through January 1st and Wesley and, you know, Methodist, uh, we use the Wesley covenant prayer, uh, the beginning mm-hmm. of uh, the watch night service it was used at. And so, you know, I am no longer my own, but thine. Yeah. Like when we do that, we're saying, I don't want to be, you know, that doesn't, I, like, this is my desire. And I love how Harry Emerson Fosick said, prayer is about fixing the desire on what you really want. And so, you know, it's not informing God of things God doesn't know. And so I am no longer my own, but thine, put me to what you will, rank me with whom you will, put me to do, put me to suffer. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full or let me be empty. Let me have all things or let me have nothing. I mean, this is that yielding. This is like, God, I want you to be God in my life. I don't want mm-hmm. my ego to be God anymore. And I find, you know, I have to continually pray that to fix my desire on where those commandments are because daily I have a tendency to wrestle with my own false gods. Yeah. And and you're not the only one. <laughs> I, think we all, <laughs> I think we all struggle with that. And I think part of our struggle with the Ten Commandments might be our struggle with that. You know, you talked about Levon saying, oh, thou shall not, who's going to be inspired by that? And, and I think I, on first response, I'm with Levon that, huh, I'm not sure if that would be a source of inspiration, but you do something in this study and you draw us to Jesus's reframing uh, to do this instead. And I wonder if you could share with us what difference this reframing makes in the life of the believer and what difference this has made in your spiritual life? Yeah, that's a really great question, Nicole. So, you know, the, again, we can see the commandments as a, as a list of thou shalt nots and uh, onerous burdens that, you know, but if you reframe that first by talking about them, and I try to do this in each chapter, that these are not onerous burdens and just thou shalt nots. Instead, they are guardrails and guideposts to point us towards the good and beautiful life. If we think about it that way, then it's like, oh, this is a loving God who is trying to help me find the good life, not 
keeping the good life from me. And, uh, and so and this is what we see with Jesus. So, you know, again, overarching, he takes the, you know, the two great commandments, which is a way of distilling. He says, you know, loving God and loving your neighbor, you know, it summarizes the law and the prophets, it, it, you know, or do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. He also says summarizes the law and the prophets. But he also, you know, he, he actually makes the Ten Commandments harder. <laughs> and on the other hand, he reframes them in a way that is easier to see because he turns them into not thou shalt nots, but thou shalt oftentimes. Right. So, um, so I think about those. And if you, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, you shall not murder, not like none of us are, you shall not kill. None of us are, are very few. I hope probably none of us listening to this are in danger of murdering anybody. So it's easy to think, well, that really doesn't relate to me. That relates to somebody else. Yes, it's right. important, but why do I need that? But then Jesus flips it and says, uh, you know, it's not just about not murdering, you know, not killing somebody else. I'm telling you, love your enemy. Mm. Wow. I got to love my enemy. That doesn't mean have warm, fuzzy feelings. It means acting with kindness, right? Which is the only, you know, I love Dr. King's, you know, you know, hate can't drive out hate. Only love can do that. Can do that. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, so Jesus, and he models this for us. So what, what I love about the commandments is he flips them on their head or expands them. And then he models what that looks like. So he hangs on a cross and he says, father, forgive them for they know not what they do to the people who just crucified him. Right. He's not just giving us, you know, pleasantries that he's going to say that he doesn't live. He actually lives these things. You know, when he talks about, you shall not commit adultery. He, you know, he talks about, uh, you know, it, this has to do not so much. It certainly has to do with what you do physically in violating a, a you know, a covenant, a relationship, but also has to do with the heart. What are we thinking? What are we feeling? What's, what are we fixing our, you know, our minds on. And, and, uh, you know, wh- you know, he talks about not swearing an oath, uh, which relates actually to two different commandments, but not swearing an oath. And that often had to do with really the commandment on you shall not misuse God's name was, was largely actually about swearing oaths in God's name, what we did in God's name. And, uh, but then he says, you know, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Don't, don't, don't even be thinking about swearing oaths, be thinking about how do I have integrity in everything that I do? And, uh, and so, you know, you're constantly seeing this picture of, Jesus taking the, these commandments. And uh, so here's another example is, you know, you shall not steal, but for Jesus, that has to do with, you see somebody who's hungry or thirsty or naked. It's not even, it's not just not taking something that belongs to somebody else. It's giving something you have yourself to somebody who needs it, even though they have no right to ask it of you. So it's, it's, it's like a, you know, it's a, it's a radical way of thinking about these commandments and life giving. You know, we, we know that when we find, when we give to other people, we find joy. I had an email from a guy this last week. He was seven, he's 78 years old. And he said, you know, I had become a mean, uh, uncharitable old man. You know, hmm. I just, I, I don't know how it happened. It happened to be somewhere along the way. And then, you know, at the church, you challenged people to practice 30 days of kindness. And, uh, and so I thought, I'm going to try that. And I started intentionally trying to be kind to people and writing, you know, thank you notes and, and, you know, writing good reviews and doing things for people, you know, and he said, an amazing thing happened. I became a happier person when mm. I treated people with kindness for 30 mm-hmm. days. And, and, you know, so that's kind of how it works when Jesus tells us do these things, you find you're actually happier in the end as a result of doing it. Well, another way that you describe the 10 commandments is as the most important set of ethics in history. And when you talk about this impact that this has on our lives and our life together, I can't help but think about what we've experienced and lived through in these last couple of days, and in particular, uh, what we saw happen at the Capitol. And I wonder if you would share with us what you think the Ten Commandments says to this political, racial, and even theological divide that our country and our church finds itself in today. Yeah. I mean, as I was watching the events unfold at the Capitol, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about these 10 commandments and, and yeah. how many of them are violated and what was happening there. And, uh, and, you know, I shared with our congregation, look, we can point our finger at those folks up there and, and we clearly need to be able to say this is wrong and mm-hmm. understand why and what was happening. But we also have to recognize there's, there's something of that in all of us right? Mm-hmm. It, left or right, wherever we stand. And I, I was thinking about Solzhenitsyn's quote, you know, that if only we could separate ourselves from the evil people, but he says the line between good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And, mm-hmm. you know, and so there's, there is inside of us, you know, both uh, the image of God, the Imago Dei and original sin that bent yeah. towards doing the wrong thing and mm-hmm. our capacity to hate and our capacity to destroy other people with our words or our actions uh, is very, very real. But when you look at the Ten Commandments and you look at what happened in, in DC, you know, part of what you find is is a question of who's 
again, who is your God? You know, what is your primary allegiance? How, what's your primary identity? And, and for many people, it's easy for their politics to become that, left or right, for our politics, mm -hmm. our ideologies to become uh, really more important than God. This is one of the interesting things, well, that, that takes you on another subject, but I always find it interesting, you know, the churches with flagpoles out front, and you've got the U.S. flag right. legally is supposed to be flown above every other flag, including the Christian flag. And I see the U.S. flag and the Christian flag, and I go, yeah, that that." Is a, that's a just a visual image of mm -hmm. of of what can happen when our right. patriotism and our our love of country becomes comes before our love of of, of God, and mm -hmm. our identity becomes wrapped up in politics, identity politics. Um, so so you think about, but but there too, I you know you can easily find in politicians how the ego, especially after a loss, the ego becomes you know you see maybe what's really most important here, maybe it's the self and my bruised and hurt ego and how I'm going to respond to that. And, and uh, that's true across, again, across political ideologies. You look to see, you know, uh, when Jesus interprets, you shall not kill as you, you also shall love your enemy. Mm -hmm. And part of what, you know, we looked at in church Sunday, we looked at first Corinthians 13 and all of the, you know, love is patient, love is kind. It is not mm -hmm. envy. It is not boastful. It's not proud. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. You, you look at all of these things and then you go, okay, so let's just see what the capital of the events, of the capital looked like, you know, and there are people carrying signs about Jesus saves. Right. And then you see people, you know, breaking down, breaking down windows. And I mean, most people agree that was wrong. It even, you know, whether you're a Trump supporter or not Trump supporter, most people would agree this is wrong, but, but what you saw there was what happens when, uh, when something besides God is at the center. And, mm -hmm. uh, and there's nothing about that that looks like kindness or agape or love. And false witness, bearing false witness, you know, when, when uh, false truths are repeated over and over and over again until people no longer can tell what's true and what's not, and people don't take the time to discover, are these things true or are they not true? Mm -hmm. We can see, you know, bearing false witness has catastrophic consequences, which by the way, the 10 commandments, they were, the reason why they're so important ethically is they were the ordering of community. They, they, God was giving these to a people who, who were becoming a nation to right. how they order their lives together. And if we don't do this, if we don't live according to these things, then we're going to find chaos or brokenness or pain, you know, and, and each one of these plays some part. I mean, even something like, uh, you know, uh, to honor the Sabbath and, and keep it holy. We live in a society, and I guess most pastors probably listening to this, where we struggle with, with Shabbat. We struggle with uh, honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy. And, and there's something disordered in our lives and in our society when we miss that one. So just repeatedly, as I was watching that next last week, I was like, this is exactly what God was trying to you know, prevent. And when we, when we don't focus on these things, when we don't meditate upon them and thinking about them, Sometimes we fail to see that our own hearts are giving way to false gods, or we've mm -hmm. created images, uh, graven images, or you know that that now have substituted for God, or or our capacity to pass things on as truth that we don't know or truth we don't even take the time to research them, mm -hmm. is bearing false witness that causes harm, and and uh, and you know acting out in in anger in a in a protest led to five people's deaths. I mean, there's mm -hmm. just a just a lot of ways in which the Ten Commandments offer us words of life. And, and when we forget them and we don't focus on them, we find pain. Mm. You know, you talked about kind of meditating and thinking on these things. And that makes me think of preparing for a sermon or even, you know, I've written a, a study along with uh, Rob Fouquet and my husband. And as we were working on this, we came with a set of what we thought it was going to be. And then the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. And you discover as you meditate something new, something that you weren't expecting. And I wonder, as you wrote this, what surprised you? Uh, what came out of your work that you weren't expecting to find? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think every chapter, you know, every, you know, every one of these commandments, there was some way that it, uh, that it was interpreted and applied to my daily life that I hadn't thought about before. I mean, really, because the Ten Commandments are something that we just kind of know and we put off to the side. Yeah, I know those mm -hmm. Ten Commandments, you know, and, <laughs> and we don't really meditate upon them or pray about them. We fail to let God speak through them. So these were, you know, these purport to be God's literal direct words to God's people. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we often, you know, we just, they're, they're back there on a bookshelf somewhere. And so um, so I found in every commandment, I can't, I can't point out, you know, like here was just the one thing. It was like every single commandment. There's like, wow. 
and I felt my toes being stepped on every time, which is always a good sign. You know, when you're, when you're, <laughs> I always pray, God, you know, as I'm working on this book, I pray that you would speak to me first and help me to hear what, what, you know, convict me and help me to hear what I need to hear and then allow me to share this with, you know, with people. And, uh, and I felt God speaking to me consistently through this book. And when I, re- I got the book from the publisher, you know, the, the week before it came out and I reread it as I, you know, you always do as an author and you look to see what would you change, <laughs> what, you know, and generally I read my books and go, this sucks. This is just terrible. <laughs> and I'm so embarrassed my name's on this thing. And uh, if I'd only had an extra year, it would have been really good. But, uh, and there are things I would have changed probably in the book, but not a lot. I felt as I was reading it, it was like, I, I kind of forgot I wrote it. And it was just like, it, again, every chapter spoke to me and challenged me. And, and that's what I hope happens for churches that are studying this. One of the things I love that we did, you know, we created a small group video uh, resource. And in that, I take people to Egypt so they can see some of the historical background. I show them the false gods and the temples in Luxor and in the, in the Valley of the Kings. And you know, we look at the treasures and how people covet, coveted things that they didn't, you know, they didn't have and a whole host of things like that. So that's, that I hope is interesting. But I also interview a rabbi friend of mine. He's the past, the rabbi of the oldest synagogue here in Kansas City and the largest in uh, Rabbi Art Nemetov. And so we spend three minutes in every one of the video sessions talking about what does this mean for the temp, you know, for, for your community. And, and as an example of something that really spoke to me, he was talking about you shall not steal. And like most of us wouldn't think that we're stealing, although I, you know, as you really dig in, you find there's a lot of ways that we might not realize that we've been or at least some of our people maybe have struggled with this. But but what got me was he said, uh, you know, the thing I think of when it comes to stealing is time. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, say more. He said, yeah, every time I'm late for a meeting and somebody's waiting for me, I'm stealing the most valuable thing they have, which is time. Mm-hmm. And uh, and when I waste somebody else's time, I'm stealing the thing that, that they can't replace. And it just convicted me because I'm late to everything. <laughs> and I am, uh, and you know, I thought, I thought I never thought of being late to meetings or wasting time as a violation of, you know, the commandment not to steal. And uh, so that's just one tiny example of, of what yeah. that looks like. Um, yeah. I, I can think of some pastors uh, who would love to be able to put that in their sermon as people yeah. request meetings. <laughs> exactly. But well, I wonder, you talk about you know, God speaking to you through each of these chapters. And as, as we prepare to wrap up our conversation, I wonder if you might just speak to the pastor, to the small group leader uh, who will work through this study, uh, not only what you hope they will take for, from it, but maybe even a blessing for them as they move through this season. Yeah. Well, first of all, part of my hope was that churches would study this together and this would unify congregations. So I, I think it's pretty cool, the thought that, you know, if, if you have children in your children's ministry, we've got this children's component to this, a study for children to do. We've got ways for families to memorize the Ten Commandments together. And so I'm thinking, how cool would that be for a family to, during the season of Lent, you know, go through the commandments four times, if you will, you know, at dinner time to take a, a different commandment, you know, and go through it for four days and then go to the next commandment or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, during the 40 days of Lent and, uh, and for children to learn with their mommies and daddies. I mean, I love that one with my granddaughter when I have a chance to teach her or things like that. So I thought this is a great unifying thing with children, teenagers, and parents to talk about mm-hmm. these things. And with the book to be able to go, okay, what does this really mean to dig in deeper? My hope was that the churches, you know, that the pastor would preach their own sermon on the, on each of the 10 commandments. They would have their own insights. I mean, they got the book and all my research that's in there, but but for them to reflect upon what does this mean in the sermon that they would give while their members that week are going to be talking about the commandment in their small group Bible studies, their Sunday school classes, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. their children and their youth doing the same thing. And what would happen if an entire congregation came through Lent and they came to the season of repentance and had a chance to see things differently and have a change of heart and change of actions that led them to the cross at mm-hmm. the conclusion of the season of Lent and the resurrection. And, and uh, so you know, my hope was that when people would do this as congregations, it would it would deepen the faith life of the community of the congregation, and of course that every pastor who would do this that they would find God speaking to them in fresh and new ways. And each each chapter has some really, you know, part of what I try to do is take the scholarship from you know the very best commentaries, and then bring together the real lived experience as a pastor. And so each chapter has some pretty amazing stories and illustrations. Mm. And and the book ends, my final two stories in the, in the book, um, one is a flight attendant that uh, worked for Delta Airlines for 
Well, I got on this flight and, and met her. We spent hours talking on my way back from, from uh, the Holy Land. And, uh, and she'd been, a, I think she was 78 years old. And she, you know, she surprised me at her age. She was still doing this. And, and then I found she was most remarkable. And as we talked about, what made her most remarkable was the fact that she was actually living these commandments and how she positively put them into practice. And then the story, the final story in the book, it's a pretty, there's a pretty remarkable piece near the end of the book on her, you know, how she lived her life that I think will really speak to people. And then the last story is a story of a woman named Sonia. And Sonia uh, was a, is a tailor. She's 95 years old and still has a tailor shop here in Kansas City. I think she's 95. And uh, she, I went to visit with her one day. And, and the first thing she did, she rolled up her sleeve to show me the numbers on her arm from the concentration camp where she was kept during the Holocaust and how her family died. And, and uh, you know, anyway, we have this, I, I share her story and in the video, you actually get to hear her story. She's in the, in the video. And, uh, and if you go to her tailor shop on the front, right as you walk in, in a huge poster, the 10 commandments. And wow. what struck me was that this woman's life, you know, her, was a summary of those 10 commandments. And so there's a lot of stories like this throughout the book that I think pastors will want to use in their, in their sermons as illustrations that at least will get them thinking about how these words apply to us. But my hope is by the time, you know, we call it words of life and, uh, and the promise, Jesus and the promise of the 10 commandments today. And my hope is that people, when they get to the end say, you know what, I needed that. And that mm-hmm. really spoke to me and drew me closer to God and helped me be a more faithful follower of Jesus because of, you know, because I read that book and uh, mm-hmm. now have those commandments memorized. So that, that's my hope and prayer for the book. It would bless people in that way. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for it. I'm excited to do something besides board games and card games with my family. So I just very selfishly, I'm looking forward to this. And I know that it's going to bless so many pastors and congregations as we journey with you. So thank you for sharing this gift with us and for sharing your time with us so that we could learn more about what inspired you to write this book. Thanks so and much. I want to so appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And I also want to thank all of our viewers for being on this journey with us. We hope that it has inspired you and equipped you to lead your congregations through the season of Lent. And special thanks to our sponsor, Amplify Media. You may now watch this entire series on demand at amplifymedia.com. Just click on the webinar link. It's my prayer that through the Holy Spirit and the work of these pastors, that you will have been blessed during this Lenten season. Keep the faith and we'll see you next time.